Welcome into the Roaring Repeater podcast here on 7220sports.com. I am Cody Tucker, joined as always by Jared Newland in our beautiful downtown Cheyenne studios. That audio uh, was Jared last week mentioning John Hoyland would go perfect in the Arizona Bowl. I told you to direct all hate mail to him because the last two times we've tried to say that John Hoyland would do anything, uh, he didn't. He came into this one missing seven of his last eight, and boy... You totally <laughs> redeemed yourself. Blind squirrel finds it out every <laughs> once in a while, I guess. <laughs> Had to keep saying it until it became true, <laughs> you, right? You willed it. You willed it. Uh, Hoyland started the scoring course. Uh, Wyoming knocking off Toledo 16-15 in the uh, last Barstool Sports Arizona Bowl. Not the last bowl, but sounds like Barstool is out, which I'm sure breaks a lot of your hearts out there. Uh, Hoyland opened the scoring 34-yard field goal. Uh, added another one from 52 yards out that hit the crossbar. Craig Bull <laughs> joked that he gave it a little <laughs> blow that sucker over, did, 6 nothing, and then on that last drive, he caps it. 24-yard game winner at the buzzer. He's on the shoulders of his teammates. Uh, just uh, you've, You had to feel really, really good for that kid after what a struggle he's had this year. Absolutely, and you know he's just – he's still grinning probably from ear to ear <laughs> yeah. and saying, you know what? Still have a future in this game. <laughs> yeah. There for a while, we we didn't know. We wondered. Yeah, he had the yips, man, really bad. And uh, of course, he was named the MVP, and rightfully so. Nobody else, man. He counted for ten of Wyoming's sixteen points in this slugfest. I can't give you all the credit though, because as I was listening to our audio, you said I expect a really high scoring game. Uh, it was anything but. I was more skeptical of that because we still don't know who Wyoming's offensive coordinator was. Craig Bowl wouldn't tell me before the bowl or after the bowl. I did see, if I'm just you know guessing, I did see Shannon Moore down there in the middle of all the guys every time they'd come to the sideline. I'd also see Haug and Joe Tripodi sitting there as well. So I think it was probably a mixture of everybody kind of chipping in there. And was Mike Grant up in the booth? No, he's always on the sideline. Okay. I didn't see him, though. I didn't see him on the sideline. I so, wasn't paying much attention. Yeah, who knows, I guess. But, <clears throat> but what a great way and what an even more fitting way for Craig Bull to end his career yeah. than the most Craig Bull esque <laughs> scoring, drive, scoring drive. drive of all time to end a game. Yeah, twelve plays, eighty seven yards, four eleven off the clock, and start off with that unbelievable pass. Oh, to, to me, Asante. The only time Asante was targeted the entire which game, which is insanity, as we talked about. But to me, Jared, other than Peasley stepping into the teeth of an oncoming blitz against Texas Tech in double overtime. To me, that was the play of the year. That was the throw of the year. He torqued so hard and just put that on a dime. It was so beautiful that, you know, that was what a fitting way for Andrew Peasley, the warrior he is, to throw that. I, I couldn't see the play develops. I thought he got waxed by a linebacker or a safety. He didn't even get touched. He put so much torque on that, and he was so injured. Twisted he, his body. He twisted yep. and hit the deck, and he was done. Last play of his college career. Couldn't be more fitting there, too. What a good story for Hoyland to do what he did. Um, that last drive, too, you know, I, I couldn't help but think. Uh, Jay Savell said during his introductory press conference that Craig Bull is passing the baton to me. I just need to finish the race. Peasley passed the baton on to Evan Svoboda, who finished the race aside from one play where he lost his helmet, and even Jaden Clemens well, had to come in. I'm just going to say that. How crazy was yeah. that? You saw three quarterbacks in one yeah. drive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was wild. But And if Toledo would have watched any film, they knew that Svoboda is going to go off tackle left. Yep. And he did that. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't get in the end zone. He had a head of steam going on one of well, those. Then he lost the ball, too. Uh, yeah, but it, how... It was kind of just so fitting the way it ended to, to pass the baton on to Sabota, who seemed cool, cool, calm, and collected, and just let him on a game winning drive. Ho hum. <laughs> Give uh, Hoyland a chip shot to win it. A guy who has, there has been no chip shots for this guy. I mean, there's no such thing in the second half of the season. Well, and of those seven misses that he did have, there were some very Long, difficult. Yes. And I really, you could say that Craig probably put him in situations that. He shouldn't have been in. Yeah, no question. So. No question. <clears throat> uh, but, I mean, I can only imagine being, oh, you golf. I mean, if you're just pushing Try. pushing everything right, it's just got to be maddening as hell. And then I imagine you overcorrect and then start screwing up even more stuff. And I know they always compare that to golf. I, I think that's a pretty damn good comparison. Yeah, and remember when it first started, he, he made a mention 
of his hips weren't in the right yeah. place and he was going to correct that. Yeah. And then maybe he overcorrected. Yep. Yeah. Well, whatever <laughs> so, it was, it wasn't working. And then, you know, it just becomes a mental game. But you have that. almost 30 days off or actually yeah. he had 30 days, over 30 days off. And yeah. You know, he was out there working on it, yep. being there every day. I loved uh, Hoyland's remarks after the game. You know, I asked him how it felt to be hoisted on shoulders and all that, and he said, man, we're just kind of the finishers. He's like, those are some big dudes out there that put in a lot of work. It's just my job to come in and finish it off. And I didn't like being hoisted because I just – I think he was just sheepish about it because, you know. But his teammates were so excited for him. They know how tough it's been. And I also mentioned uh, in that press conference, Easton Gibbs was on one side and Peasley was on the other, and I said – what does it mean to you? And I pointed at both of those guys. I said, I've asked both of these guys specifically about you and if they lost any faith in you whatsoever and if it puts any more pressure on Peasley to know you got to get a first down, you've got to get this ball in the end zone or you're not getting any points. They never wavered. In fact, they looked at me like I was an absolute fool, and they said, we have n- no doubt. we have seen this guy do it over and over again. It was really cool to see that. I was really proud. And John Hoyland is one of the good ones, man. He's a good dude. I can see how most people are like, yeah, the place kicker is just some dummy sitting around in the corner. But his teammates actually love this kid, and he has a great personality and was really happy for him and his family. So fitting in, overall, fan experience, was it was it good? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, Friday was a really long day for me. Man, started at about noon and didn't end until about midnight. That sounds like a good day. Yeah, and didn't have a lot of food in between, too, so that made it for a rough Saturday morning. <laughs> Who did I, t- I talked to somebody that said, I saw Newland, and he was f- feeling good. Yeah, I, ha- I had some fun. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we um, you know, we went to the pep rally. Then we went to the alumni association deal. Then we went to the Crest Insurance Party, and it just kept going. I just ran, and I ran into some people that I see every once in a while, but really got to sit there and visit with them. Yeah. And ha- had a good time. And then, you know, Saturday, I I was pretty calm on Saturday, to be honest with you. Yeah. And plus, the game, let's be honest, it was boring as hell. Yeah, the the, the middle two quarters. Yeah, were, the, the were first boring. quarter was fun, the, and obviously the end of the fourth, uh, end of the game. But in between, it was just kind of like ho-hum, and yeah. we were sitting down majority of the time because yeah. there wasn't nothing, there wasn't anything to cheer about. Yeah. And except for some people behind me, and I don't even know how they got those seats because they were students. So their parents must have bought them for them because I was in the donor section, you know, where you mm-hmm. have to be, have pretty good priority points. Yeah. And it was like, that's a WIO first down, boop, boop, beep, beep. <laughs> yeah. And every single first down. And I can't believe people around them didn't. Really? Because I was around some people that. Funny I, duddies. Yeah. That su- I was surprised they didn't say something. Yeah. My Friday was uh, not as good uh, at your recommendation, I must say. I went to Sedona, which you forgot to mention was like the Jackson Hole of Arizona. What a nightmare that place is. Man buns for days, hippies, yuppies. Even the pizza joints look like they're six-star restaurants. <laughs> it was so sh- terrible. <laughs> you got to you gotta explore a little more, Cody. I hear like hiking, and then they were talking about natural healing crap, and I'm like, what but the hell are we the doing The scenery here? was Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Great. I'm just busting balls, yeah. but it was it was gorgeous. Um but yeah, it was also like traffic jams and people everywhere. It is further off the main highway than one would think. It though. took forever yeah. to get there and I was coming from Scottsdale and it took absolutely forever. There was times on that drive over there where you're going over like Summit basically dead stop or 25 miles an hour and I'm like where the hell are all these cars coming from and where are they going? I'd never imagined Scottsdale to Flagstaff would be Wall-to-wall traffic. It was. <laughs> it was 25 miles an hour everywhere you went. And then we started going down that main hill into Sedona, and it was a huge traffic jam. And I'm like, I'm flipping a bitch. I, I can't <laughs> do this anymore. And I didn't see anywhere good to eat. Everything looked outrageous. So we flipped around, and we ended up in Cottonwood, Arizona, which to me reminds me of, like, the Cody compared to Jackson. It's still yuppie. There's still some rich areas, all that. But it was fun, and there were more locals. Huh. We had a great time. It was cool. But what a long drive. Holy cow. And I love driving out there and seeing the desert landscape and all that. It's really cool. But my God, it just took forever. And uh, like Sedona was beautiful, though. You should have done that on the first day you went. Should have. I did that on the Friday instead. I, I kind of steered clear of Tucson a little bit. I went there a couple days. Um, 
to uh you know when bull had his availability and stuff like that went to that and uh but really stayed in scottsdale and it was good man but it was just everything took forever to get to it was a pain in the ass but fun man it was fun tucson was fun i thought they did a great job putting on the bowl once again um and great weather. You know, of course, the first question, not everybody, well, how many Wyoming fans? Well, there's no way to really tell. Yeah. Because you, only so many of them buy through the university. Mm-hmm. But you could tell that it was, the the contingent was larger than the two previous. Did Arizona. you think so? I thought so. Yeah. I thought Toledo did a great job. Yeah. Uh, there was more. To, yeah. Out in the tailgate area, though, it was 20 to 1. Oh, easy. I did walk through the tailgate area. I mean, there was one table that was standing right behind us. Other than that, it was very rare did we see a Toledo person. Yeah, I saw some parents. That was it. But I was impressed when you looked down. I'd look down under the press box, and I'm like, wow, there's way more people here than Ohio or Georgia State. There was, below you, there was a lot of Wyoming fans on that side Mm. that had bought tickets just through the bowl site or whatever instead of doing what they should do and buy through the Wyoming site. Right. Um, But – there were there was a lot of Wyoming fans like during introductions and touchdowns so like that you saw people stand up and it was kind of hard because some Toledo fans had gold on as well. True, so. I, I heard Toledo's SID go. Well, maybe this won't look so bad on TV because they kind of wear the same colors as we do. <laughs> maybe people will think they're Toledo fans. Um, hats off to Toledo, man. They lost a lot of firepower in the transfer portal, and uh, I tell you what, that Jacquez Stewart, who turned a what I was. I literally thought this could be for my turning point column at the end of the game. Craig Bull punting the ball near midfield, facing a fourth and one in a slugfest of a game. He punts it away. Stewart, let's be real, Clayton Stewart had a horrendous day. Craig Bull absolutely peeled paint every time Stewart came back to the sideline. I even watched his bull grab Ralph Awaz and was like, you're in. And they didn't have to punt again the rest of the day. And thank God he didn't get Clayton too frazzled because Clayton still had to hold on these kicks from John Hoyland. But he punts the ball, thought that was a huge mistake. Uh, Craig Bull going out the way he came in, uh, very conservative. Jacquez Stewart, the backup of Penny Boone, turns it up. He's fast. 80 yards. He was so fast. That was uh, that was like Xavier Worthy looking from Texas. He absolutely dusted. You could tell Isaac White didn't have a clue how fast that guy was. Couldn't even use the sideline as an extra defender. Just got his doors absolutely blown off by that kid. And you're like, wow, there's a swing right there. Instead of putting the pressure on, getting a f- you, you're telling me you can't bring Evan Sabota in and get a fourth and one? You're telling me you can't put the the ball in the belly of Harrison Whaley, who always falls forward, and get a fourth and one? Yep. And why are we being... Why are we being conservative Last right game now? of the year. Yeah, Let's go. What are we doing? So I really thought, oh, my God, this is how I'm going to have to pin Craig Bull's last ever uh, turning point, which is him being conservative and Toledo taking full advantage. But really, the Cowboys' defense played really well. Uh, I thought Toledo's defense played really well. They really got after Andrew Peasley. They beat him up pretty good. I thought Wyoming's offensive line – had its moments. They struggled a little bit. Luke Sandy got blown up a few times. Uh, even Frank Crum didn't have his best outing. And, and most of Whaley's yards was hard. Hard earned. Yeah. I think his longest rush of the day was 12, and I think it came on that uh, – the the, the 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 touchdown drive, the lone touchdown drive of the game, which was the second-to-last drive of the game. Uh, I think he broke a 12 or 14-yarder, and that was, that was that, man. It was hard earned, 92 yards on the day, so – um, really good game between pr- two pretty evenly matched teams. I thought Tucker Gleason, the quarterback for Toledo, looked just fine. He looked in rhythm. I thought Peasley made some unbelievable throws. That throw he made to John Michael Gillenborg, I believe, on the last play of the first quarter, just lofted one over on a third and one and hit him for a 34-yard gain. That was a beauty. Uh, that throw to Asani, though, I'll – I'll never forget that one. That was absolutely on a rope. 26 yarder. Beautiful to launch that game winning drive. It was beautiful. When you look at the receiving for Wyoming, too, nine, nine. guys caught the ball. Yeah. And we've said that a lot this season. We have. And that's something that we hadn't seen or talked about in the past, for sure. I think it's spreading the wealth. I think it's good, but I think it's also not good because they need, Asani needed the ball oh. way more. And that's not being selfish or anything. That is your best playmaker on the outside. And were you and I looking at Asante on every single play to no. see? But he, no. there was downs that he was on the sideline. Yeah. I'm like, why isn't he in the game? And no. also on the on rushing, there was also, you know, there was eight guys who carried the ball. And granted, uh, one was forced in there with Jaden Clemens. 
but eight different people rush the ball. Yeah. And you just don't see that a lot either. It's usually, you know, four. Yeah. Yeah. And you wonder, I really did wonder, Craig was not going to be talking about that at the end of the game. Uh, he, as he would say, you're pour, pouring cold water on this. Uh, who was the OC? And did that muddy some stuff up? I mean, they gained 28 yards in the third quarter, and it looked really bad. And, and Peasley was getting teed off on. And you had to it kind of crept in my mind, like, are they kind of throwing in the towel here? Is this, is this it? Well, and being conservative at the end of the first half again. Again. And Wyoming fans were booing. Some of the players on the sideline were actually encouraging the Wyoming fans to boo. Well, we just saw what they did at UNLV. If it wasn't for a pick there in the end zone, they moved the ball right down the yep. field. And we talked about it on the kickoff show about how those last two games of the season, Wyoming, they were in the huddles, but it was more of a hurry-up yeah. offense once they got to the line of scrimmage. And, you know, they were in rhythm. They were really never, never in rhythm in this game against Toledo until that last series of the game. Yeah, and I'm sure that does have something to do with, out, with an OC. I mean, can you imagine the pressure of never calling plays and then all of a sudden you're calling plays? That's why I think we brought it up on the show. Let Andrew do some of it himself. Yeah, He's yeah. the one that's out there in rhythm. And I wonder if he did. I wonder if they kind of gave him a little bit of the rain. I don't know. It'd be interesting. I mean, I guess that's something I'll have to ask down the road and write a follow-up story on someday. But uh, they yeah, you're were not, not getting the answer from the guy that <laughs> you should be getting. Yeah, don't from. need to worry about that anymore. A um, lot of good things. It was, uh, you know, we we did predict too that Craig Bull would get carried off. Uh, instead, it was John Hoyland, which is cool. Craig, uh, I watched Craig. I. I, I was right by where Hoyland was when he got lifted up, but I kind of beelined it for Craig to see if he was crying or see what his reaction was. And he kind of stood over by the podium and just kind of stared at what was going on and just kind of smiled and saw his wife come up, and she was just ecstatic, and it was a cool moment. Also, uh, here comes a guy shaking hands, and I actually heard this whole conversation, Sean Chambers. Walks up and shakes hands with Bull, and Bull says, Sean, it's so good to see you. I'm so proud of what you've accomplished. Thanks for coming. I r- really appreciate you coming. Yeah, I saw him on the sideline. Wearing and, Wyoming uh, stuff. Yeah, and Berman uh, was talking to him for a while down yeah. there. Saw Master P before the game on the sideline. You know who that is? I've heard of him, but I don't. I wouldn't know him from Adam. <laughs> He's a rapper, and it looked like he was hawking cereal. Uh, he was down on the sideline, so I figured it was some kind of goofy barstool stuff. Future sponsor, maybe? <laughs> I mean, we. His son plays basketball for Louisville, so I doubt it. Well, He's we talking. we saw the Pop Tarts ball, bowl, <laughs> which was one of the best marketing campaigns of a bowl game, yeah, probably ever. And the Cheez It guy, yeah, Cheez It guy was good too. You see when they were on the podium getting their getting their uh, trophy, the Cheez It mascots like putting a box of Cheez Its in front of the coach. Finally, the lady with the microphone grabbed it and moved it out of the way. I think you will start seeing more of this type of – I hope advertising agencies don't go too far yeah. with this, but whoever did the Pop-Tarts um, marketing campaign should be given a bonus or Anheuser-Busch should hire them immediately. <laughs> yeah. Did you see the <clears throat> One Shining Moments uh, yes. video? They showed that Pop-Tart 75 times during that thing. And they did show bowl, which was cool, yeah. and they showed Hoyland, Hoyland kicking, but that was cool. You're right. It was a marketing whiz there. That was good stuff. Um, just to put a bow on this bowl game, I, uh, you know, the Cowboys won nine games this year. Um, I think we should all be really pleased with that, and I know we're not because it could have been so much more. But anybody before the season, what would you say, Vegas over under was six? Yep. Um, anybody before this game or before this season, I don't think anybody would have told you nine wins for the most part. I know Ryan Thorber and Alex Taylor and I, we all picked the Cowboys to finish second. People were like, "You're nuts!" And they fin- they were picked what overall sixth or something or fifth before sixth, the I season think. started. I mean, we knew they were way better than that, and we knew the Mountain West media had not done their homework or were just flat out disrespecting Wyoming. Um, we knew they'd be good. I'm not shocked at all to see nine and four, but I'm. It's still like damn. Ten, ten and three, eleven and two was there for the taking. There for the taking. You beat Air Force. You, you show up against Boise State. Uh, Wyoming scores before the half against UNLV. Uh, you just never know. And, I mean, you could even really dig here and be like, hey, they hold on in Austin. Uh, you never know. Get that thing to overtime at least. But uh, 
Uh, that's the problem, man. It's just, damn it. It's right there for the taking. But I tell you what, man, looking ahead here, um, Cowboys are in good shape. And I asked you this before we came on the air, and neither one of us really had an answer. I think we did, Boise State. But how do you vote if you were to vote today, which isn't necessarily a fair question because the portal still is active and all that, and then there's a spring window that opens April 15th through the 30th. And for those of you who don't know, after a bowl game, if you play a late bowl game like the Cowboys did, you still have five days to enter the portal. So today is the cutoff for Wyoming Wyoming guys to enter. Uh, right now that number sits at six, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But how do you vote the Mountain West next year? I, I think you have to put Wyoming up top, not not at the top, but around the top. But top I, five for sure. But I'd also understand reservations. A new coach, a new quarterback. Um, they have a lot of wide receivers to replace. Um, but other than that, I think Chase Uinoa, who by all accounts is coming back, I think he probably slides over to the middle in place of Easton Gibbs. Shea was a tackling machine this year. He had a really good year. Uh, did not miss the tackles that he did two years ago. I think a Connor Shea and a Cole DeMarzo maybe sh- share you know reps on the outside. Uh, the weak side linebacker spot. Other than that, I think you're really in good shape aside from Cole Goodbow. But, I mean, they they revolved those positions at D-tackle over and over again. So all those guys got a lot of playing time. I see Gavin Meyer stepping in. And those undersized guys are just going to put on weight and it, get stronger. Yep, and all the coaches have said, we haven't seen them yet. Uh, Easton Gibbs mentioned this in his uh, last post-game press conference after the Arizona Bowl that you guys don't even know about some of the dudes that are coming up. And he said, you know, Coach Bowl always says it's a developmental program. There are some cats that are developing, and a lot of those guys are on the defensive front. Two guys by the name of Jaden Williams that they're really excited about the defensive tackle spot, and they they really recruited that position hard. Oscar Giles obviously is doing a bang-up job. But you have Siders back. You have Harris back. Um, Harsh back. Um, so I think you're really good on the defensive front. Uh, safeties are both back. Eckler and White are both back. Um, you do lose Buck Coors, who announced this week that he is going to retire from the game of football. Uh, wasn't entirely shocked about that one. I had heard that before the game. Um didn't pry. Wanted to see what you know. I'd heard he had a he had an opportunity outside of football. Um, so wanted to let him announce that and not bug him about it. But um, they do need to replace Jacory Hawkins. But Ian Bell got a lot of playing time this year for Colby Taylor. So um, another guy who has experience. Plus, they really like Keani Parks, a guy who moved from running back to uh, to the cornerback spot. So and Jay Savell is a defensive coach. Defense is going to be just fine. They're going to be really good again. Um, Offensively, though, you just you have to find another Ayer Asante. And I saw that they just offered a guy from Army. They've offered a guy from Arkansas Pine Bluffs. You need Devin Body Jr. to start showing flashes of what he can be as a guy who played SEC football. You need to see him step up. Uh, who's going to replace Wyatt Whelan as the possession guy? I think Will Pellisier could possibly be that dude. Gunnar Gentry's gone. Ryan Marquez is gone. Trayton Welch is gone. Other than that, uh, John Michael Gillenborg's going to be a star. He's a star player. I think you lose uh, Frank Crum on the line. I think easily you put Jack Walsh uh, on on uh, Svoboda's blind side, or you you move Caden Barnett, who missed this game with a shoulder injury. You move him over to that side. Uh, I think they're going to be just fine there. There were some guys on the sideline that were offensive linemen that were some big dudes yeah. that are in that developmental process. Yep. And I don't know if they were true freshmen, true sophomores, red shirt soft freshmen, whatever they were. They're big. Yeah, no doubt. So they, they got guys. Guys are in the pipeline, and I, th- I, I I don't think that they're literally saying, like, this is our recipe per se, but I think what I see happening is they have not developed wide receivers very well. That's no secret. Maybe you get those guys out of the portal, but you keep developing the guys on the lines, and you keep developing those linebackers and stuff like that, and then you fill – needs with the portal maybe they go out and get a a corner i saw kids visiting from junior college a corner is going to be visiting laramie from junior college maybe those are the spots where you where you load up in the portal and they're never going to load up but maybe you get four or five guys out of the portal but i don't think very often you're going to see linemen you're not going to see linebackers you're not going to see safety stuff like that i think those are always have been developed in-house um and those are going to be for the p5 schools to yeah. Take from the G5 schools. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. And that's going to happen. And right now, like you said, six guys in the transfer portal. Cowboys are making out like a bandit right now. Um, and I, I'm not shocked. 
Chase Locke, wide receiver from USC who transferred to Wyoming, never saw the field in two years. Caden Hawkins, he played two games, I want to say, on special teams. He's gone. Brady Holtman, a walk-on freshman who didn't play this year, just walked on at Missouri in his home state. Good for him. Good luck. Linebacker didn't work out whatever, for whatever reason. He's gone. He never played. Keelan Cox, Alabama transfer. He's in the portal. Never played. DQ James, all but ineffective in the three games he played this year. Really was not effective at all. And I'm not blaming him for that pick six against App State, but it just it, something was off this year. It just was not flowing. He was getting killed. He was not only getting tackled, he was getting mangled. Uh, Colby Taylor, ineffective, benched his last three games, two games. Um, that's who's in the transfer portal for the Wyoming Cowboys. You got to be feeling pretty damn good. Yeah, there's, and when people say it's the portal this, portal that, Wyoming overall really hasn't lost a lot. No. I mean, you even go back to last year where the um, lineman that went to USC. Pregnant. Pregnant. Yeah. He would have been huge, of course, this year. Yeah. But other than that. Yeah. And then two years ago, yeah, Naor. Two but, years ago sucked. And people always say, well, he should he should come back to Wyoming. He And he's, I think, taking a visit Nebraska, to Nebraska. Yeah. But maybe maybe he gets hurt here too. You never know. Yeah. I did talk to a guy. Um, I I guess don't mind saying his name. I ran into Tevis Bartlett at uh, a local bar here in Cheyenne around Christmas. And, uh, of course, he had a great career. Cheyenne East went on to, to Washington to play for the Huskies and had a really nice career. He's now actually just uh, gonna gonna join the staff with Jeff Choate over at Nevada, but he worked with Jeff uh, at Washington and at Texas, and he kind of talked to me. I said, "What happened with Nair? Like, what is what is going on?" And he just kind of said, "You know, it was just kind of wasn't a fit, uh, maybe personality wise, more so than anything. Just kind of wasn't one of the boys, I guess you could say." And then the injury didn't help. The injury yeah. certainly didn't help. But uh, Nayer, I watched him a lot during that Texas game. He stood there with his helmet, like, behind his back, like a guy who you knew was never going to get in this game. And then <laughs> right after the game, I was like, I'm going to watch Nayer and see if he shakes hands with guys or goes and has anything to say with Bull. And he walked right off the field, didn't say hi, bye, nothing to nobody. Which is Crazy that he doesn't have one guy that he stays in touch with. One guy. You know, something like that. Cam Stone said hi to everyone when Hawaii was here, including the media. He came up and said, what's up to me? And is just, he he had a lot of friends. I saw coaches hugging him, not Bull. I didn't see Bull doing it, but I saw Savell doing it. I saw all kinds of coaches going up and hugging him. Uh, was he a loss? Yeah. I think the Cowboys secondary would have been... I think the corner room would have been better with Cam Stone in it, with a year under his, another year under his belt. But Olawasi Amoto show, he didn't do anything at Oregon State. He had a strip sack and a blowout blowout win over Stanford in like the fourth quarter. Those are your big dogs that left in the portal last year. The year before was brutal, but it was also new, and Bowl was at that time going, yeah, whatever, if you don't want a cowboy up, you can get the hell out of here. That's not how it works, and you can't say stuff like that and. Now he knows, and he yep. adjusted, and I think Craig Bull deserves a lot of credit for being an old dog who learned some new tricks. And moving forward, we know that Jay Savell is a player's coach. Yes. Yep. I think he's going to have so many Bull qualities, but also have the quality Bull didn't, and that's just being a flat-out people person who – and not that Bull's not. He, Bull has a great personality. He's funny as hell. He's all that. But he took that CEO Tom Osborne thing, and he lived and died with it. Like, I'm not your best friend. I'm your coach. You know, I've just watched, uh, rewatched last night the Bill Parcells, Bill Belichick between two Bills, 30 for 30. Do you think Lawrence Taylor was having beers with the head coach or Bill Belichick? Hell no, but he was winning Super Bowls. Lawrence Taylor did much heavier <laughs> stuff than drink beer. <laughs> he was doing cocaine with Bill Parcells. <laughs> but those guys weren't buddies, but that was the 80s. This is a whole new ball game. It's not a it's not a dictatorship anymore, unfortunately. Uh, not unfortunately. It's just not a dictatorship anymore. Yeah, and you have to relate to these young kids. And yeah. Even you and I. I mean I have trouble relating sometimes. Yeah, and it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. What's snap snap what? Yeah. But yeah. you know what I mean? It's you have to play that game or you're not gonna be yeah. in the mix for a lot of these guys. And we even hear, you know, like when Dave Christensen came here and took over and said, I have, to be, I have to be Nike or I can't recruit kids. Yeah. And I'm one of them that said is like, well, Wyoming doesn't need those kind of kids. Yeah. If, they're, if that's the reason they're choosing the school. Yeah. Yeah. I but, mean, and names on the back of the jerseys, I get it. But at the same time, play the game. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm I'm kind of both sides. Yeah, I'm on the fence. Yeah. I'm on the fence with that. Um, I love the Nike. I love the resurgence of of cool uniforms and all that. Um, I don't think it needs to go that nuts for sure. Love that he's going to potentially he's going to wear an all white. And what a better time to do that than in Arizona State in the opener when it's going to be 150 degrees. It'll most likely be a night game. But yeah, you know, it has to yeah. be. I, I, don't, I don't think. I don't think the state of Arizona would even let that happen during the and day. Thank goodness it's not won't be on the Pac-12 network because there is no Pac-12 moving yeah, forward. Yeah, it'll be on the Big ESPN 12. Plus Big 12 network. Yeah, that's true. Or whatever else. Yeah, I actually drove by Sun Devil Stadium when I was down there, um, and it's uh, it's cool, man. It's it's, it's totally cool. redone now. Yeah, it's beautiful. They took some seats out. It's a smaller venue. The end. End zone complex is fully completed now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's, it's a good cool. looking stadium. It's right in the mountains there. It's yep. just like tucked in. It's it's gonna be really cool, uh, really cool experience. And by all accounts, Evan Spoto will be under center, hometown kid from Mesa, Arizona. He'll be under uh, under center that day. So uh, more than twenty one hundred players are in the transfer portal, according to Sports Illustrated. Um, Wyoming is only only responsible for six of those. So uh, I think uh, some stuff we have to look forward to, of course, pro days around the corner. Um, and I'll get back to that in a sec because I want your opinion on this. February signing day, traditional signing day also coming up. Jay Savell has made it abundantly clear the Cowboys are not done. Um, and I think that's where you're going to see the transfers and some portal guys sign with the Pokes. Um, spring game coming up, April Offensive coordinator, safeties coach, right around the corner, uh, coming this weekend, uh, according to Jay Sawbell. And we talked about that before we went on the air. Like, who do you think? And we were both like, we have no clue. Don't even know where to begin. I want to write a story saying, hey, maybe. Those are always just fun stories anyway, but I don't know where to begin. And I brought it up before, you know, Javon Bonite. He's been at some places, Utah State. Oregon, text. Well, he went to Texas Tech and then got the job. Yeah, <clears throat> and then and then he was at Kentucky. Kentucky. Then he was at Marshall. Now he's doesn't have a job. But has he ever <laughs> called plays? I mean, he's been a wide receivers coach. Yeah, but I just think his career has taken the turn the other way yeah. instead of yeah. to where he, where he would have been a guy. But you just think of guys like that who are in those kind of offenses that we would like to see. Yeah. Well, and you wonder if Jay Savell's ever even heard of that name before. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, Javon's had some off-the-field stuff go on. And um, I don't know, does he stick with his coaching tree? We talked about that. He went to Mount Union. ton of dudes are in the coaching profession from Mount Union. Uh, Jerry Kill, his mentor, just retired at New Mexico State. And they're starting to lose staff and players like it's going out of style. Would you work uh, for Tony Sanchez, though? I would. Because I like him right. as a human, I don't know if we'd be around working together long, but <laughs> we'd uh, we'd get along. Um, Just because you like Coors. Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he's uh, he, Jerry. Does he go with the Jerry Kill tree? Does he? Is somebody still around from the Lou Holtz days? Uh, I don't know. Well, and I brought this up too. There, you know, there's tons of people out there that we don't even. Yeah, yeah. We have no idea about, but. Kalen DeBoer, the head coach at Washington, his offense coordinator. They were they. We're at Sioux Falls College together. He hired him out of working at a cement plant. Yeah. I mean, this guy had played. He had called some plays in high school and yeah. they, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden, he's the offensive coordinator of the team that's playing for the national championship. Yeah. And we talked about Tim Paul was the same way. He was a lumberjack when Craig Bull called him. He had to sleep in the Fargo Dome because he didn't have enough money, didn't make enough money to even be a coach, but he just chased his dream and did it. And now he's the head coach there. So I do know, I have heard of one guy who has applied. Um, I do know that. And that is a local guy um, who's now coaching college elsewhere. Um, but that's just applied. I don't, I don't believe he's had a, a formal interview. And if Savell's going to have somebody hired here in the next two to four or five days, uh, I don't think that's the guy. Yeah, I, either somebody's on campus that we don't know about today and or tomorrow, or Jay is on the road meeting these people yeah. at undisclosed locations. Yeah. And I also, it's kind of funny, uh, you know, obviously Aaron Bull has been uh, vaulted to the defensive coordinator spot. Now the linebackers coach is open as well, and I figured, you know, maybe Aaron would just do both defensive coordinator and linebackers. We've seen that before. Um I asked Brian Hendricks before the Arizona ball on the field, like, hey, that linebacker's job's open. Are you going to do that? Are you going to be the linebacker's coach now? And he goes, man, it's going to be a really good day. I said, you are going to be the linebacker's coach, aren't you? He goes, man, I'm really looking forward to this game. (laughs) 
So take that for what it's worth. Um, I think you could very easily see Hendricks slide back to linebackers. And why wouldn't Oscar Giles just have the entire defensive line? Yep. I've never understood, you know. But it's been that way for a while. I know. Even Pete Calgus yeah. was one or the other. And then yeah. um, AJ Coach Cooper English. And English. Yeah. It, it was, yeah, it's a weird deal. But uh, but then does that mean maybe Bull takes over the safeties? Could. I mean, that's what Jay Saville did. Yeah, and then they still have another spot. Yeah, and, and Jake Dickert. On that side. Yeah. And then you have, obviously, the OC position, who most likely will be the quarterback's yes. coach. Yeah. And then maybe one guy on the offensive side leaves. And then you replace that person. Yeah. I still want to see a special teams coordinator. Yeah, just one one cook in the kitchen I think would be really cool. And maybe that's why there's a defensive tackles coach. Because as we found out this year, Oscar Giles had something to do with field goal block. Yeah. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. And he was the run defensive coordinator. Um, and he's the freshman coach. He wears a ton of hats. So, Maybe that's the deal, too, that they're just like, all right, the defensive tackles coach is also going to handle field goal block. Um, so, and maybe they bring another guy on just as a defensive ends coach so he can, yeah, coach the defensive ends, but also an extra recruiter that goes to an extra area. I don't know. But I could totally see Hendricks moving to linebackers. And they're going to hire a safeties coach, he said, and they're going to hire, obviously, an offensive coordinator. Maybe a fake punt every once in a while. Who knows? That'd be all right. <laughs> I wondered if they were going to fake that uh, field goal, that 52-yarder Hoyland hit. Because I'm like, man, they're putting him out there for a 52-yarder after he just felt good making his first one. <laughs> Go back to that real quick. About the 20-yard line, it kind of looks like it hit hits its apex, and it's like, there's no way that's getting there. I thought and the it same. it just kept going and then mm-hmm. hits the crossbar. I thought the same. I said, oh, no way that's <laughs> going to make that. And, and honestly, one of the kicks he made this year, and I want to say it was against CSU, I was on the field, and – it didn't have the distance by 10. So not only was he missing to the right, he was not getting all of it, and it was just kind of That like, was the game, Whoa. though, that had a lot of swirling wind. Yeah. Because you looked at flags, and it wasn't there, but it was still blown in your face. It was like, where's this coming from? Yeah, that one so. didn't have a chance in hell. I don't even think it made the goal line. It was. Yes, yeah, and it was like, wow, what are, what the hell are they calling here? Um who are some guys play at the next level, you think, from this team? I, I think Frank Crum's an obvious uh, guy who he's told me that his draft grade's around the sixth or seventh round. He handled Texas relatively easy. Texas Tech, relatively easy. Did struggle a little bit uh, with Toledo. That was not uh, his think best game. but He is better against bull rushes than against true speed edge rushers. He's big, man. Yeah. That's a lot yeah. of weight to get around. And he, he, he won't play left tackle yeah. in the NFL. True. Um, well, obviously, he and him, uh, Goodbo. Yeah. I truly – and he signed with the agency yesterday, yeah. it looked like. I think Goodbo was more beat up than any of us could ever yeah. imagine this year. He did not have his normal – He had a great bowl game, though. He did. He's dis- he's always been disruptive. And, it, and at that position, it doesn't always have to be show up in the stats. But he was not – his disruptive self. They, and, you know, I think he was really banged up this of year. Of course, Deason Gibbs. He's going to, you know, he, he de- officially declared. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, if he – other than that, I honestly don't know. Um, I, You know, Welch, I think his – He's big. He's big, but I just – he's been beat up a little bit too. Yeah. You know, I see him not only getting dra- – I see him getting drafted, and I see him sticking for a while, is Ja'Cory Hawkins. Because at Wyoming's Pro Day, he's going to run like twenty fuck, like twenty three miles an hour, which is what got Rico Gafford his shot. Yep. And maybe they go, all right, you're not. And he's tall. He's a he's a lanky corner. Maybe you don't. Maybe you do what you did with Rico Gafford and go. You're not a corner. You're going to be a wide receiver and you're going to be a kick returner. Like that dude is lightning fast. He was the fastest guy in the SEC during two weeks during his career at Ole Miss in the SEC. And nobody was touching him when he returned those kicks or when he returned those blocks against yep. New Mexico mm-hmm. and App State. He was gone. So I could see him. He's going to be one of those guys that really jumps off the chart at Pro Day, and they're going to go, whoa, that dude can flat get it. And you know NFL guys take chances on dudes like that. They're like, hell, if this guy can run 23 miles an hour, yep. we'll, we'll see you where we can put him. can't coach speed, but we can put him in somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we'll see where we can put him. Yep. Um, so I think uh, – and you mentioned a new league that's forming, uh, which could be a godsend to a lot of these guys. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the merging, the merging of the USFL and the XFL, and it's now called the UFL, which is the United Football League. And um, the and, Rock's behind it. It starts uh, March 30th. And you think it's going to be a feeder, not a competitor? 
Yeah, it because it's it's in the spring. Yeah. You know, and and I think that's what they really want to make it is a feeder in the future. Obviously, this year there's some NFL teams that'll invite these guys to um to camp yeah. if, if they stand out that much. That but I just don't see people that are able to do both. You know, I mean like play eight eight games plus playoff games in the UFL and then go play a 17 game schedule. That's a lot of wear and tear on yeah, your body, but Certain positions, I'm, I'm sure you can probably do it. But That could be good for a guy like Xavion Valade who's sitting on a practice, practice squad, squad all yep. year. Um, and a Brian Hill who keeps emerging, you know, every every other month it seems like he's on a new roster. And you mentioned something. Rico Gabbard. Rico, I mean, yeah. that's a possibility for him too. Yeah. So And a Tyler Hall, even though he he's seen a lot of playing time with the Raiders this year. Yeah. But then again, you know, you want to go actually play every game instead of just – Every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. So, You know who I really want to see, and this is obviously a dark horse, and half the people listening to more than half the people listening to this are going to say you're out of your mind. I would love to see Andrew Peasley figure it out because you mentioned a stat before we came on the air that's insane. 82 NFL quarterbacks have taken snaps this year. Yeah, going into this weekend. <laughs> and I'm not saying Andrew Peasley's necessarily going to be in the NFL, but I would love to see him making money playing the game of football, whether that's in Canada or this new league or whatever it is. Even if it's over with Dave Christensen in Germany, I would love to see that kid should play football. He He's a football player, man. He just – I loves lo- the game. Loves it. I love that guy, and I'm – I, I think he's one of those guys that you're, he's not going to be appreciated until maybe down the road a little bit. But, man, he just he laid it all out on the line. And his teammates love him, and I love him too. And he's made a lot of good passes this year, but mm-hmm. that one to Asante on the oh, last drive was, was perfect. One of his best. Oh, it was so good. And he, he, I would hope that he would probably tell you that too. Maybe yeah. he would say, no, what about this one? Oh. That we maybe weren't paying attention as a much of attention to but go rewatch that one <laughs> go rewatch that he also said and he told me this in a one-on-one interview but he left out a really big part uh which kind of makes me mad <laughs> but he mentioned at the podium on saturday night he said you know i have mentioned this on the show he said uh you know i've seen a couple of quarterbacks in my life that are really special and they have it and he mentioned jordan love who he backed up at utah state and he mentioned evan Sabota. Has to make you feel good. But the part he left out that he mentioned in Arizona was his recruiting trip back in 2017. Can you believe that? All the way back in 2017 was Wyoming, Utah State, and Logan. Josh Allen versus Jordan Love. And he said, I sat on the sideline and I watched those dudes warm up. And then I watched them play a game against each other. And I, like, can I even do this? (laughs) Like, these guys are legit. So he left that part out about his recruiting trip being a Wyoming game and Josh <laughs> Allen. But he was just like, those guys are really special. And Evan is in that category of guys that just can spin it and have have it. So you have to feel really good. I you can hear a coach tell you until they're blue in the face, oh, he's really he's good. He's good. He's gonna be he's gonna be solid. But when one of your peers, especially a guy who your mentor, you know, your mentor and a guy who you're behind is telling saying that stuff about you. Uh, I think that's more telling. Evan's throwing motion is different yeah. than a lot of guys that you see. Yeah. It does seem kind of long-winded and over the top. But his arms are so dang long. Uh, they it are. It does take a while to they are. wound up. But I think he's going to be – I mean, he's still so raw. He's still so fresh, man. I think he, he's going to get a ton of reps in the spring. I'm really excited for spring ball. I really am because of that position. Really excited to see what he can do. Are you going to be able to watch any of it, though? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Jay, I, Jay, I think is going to be more open about stuff. And it's don't get me wrong. It's not like I want to go sit out at practice five days a week because I don't. But if you could just watch one, like when we're over there to do interviews, say on a Monday, and we can actually watch the practice, that would be that'd be phenomenal. And it's not about reporting. Like Tom Izzo used to tell us all the time when I covered Michigan State, you can watch all the practices you want. You can sit here all you want. But if you tweet out about somebody getting injured or you tweet out about me peeling paint and ripping someone's ass and telling them yep. I'm kicking them off the team and I hate you and I hope you die, then you're never going to watch another practice. And plus, like a Monday is not game preparation anyway. No. It's more lax. Yeah. More, yeah. yeah. So a bloody Tuesday is where it yeah. really kicks in. Uh, and they're not going to show us that. But, man, you know, Craig even let us watch the opening 10 minutes of practice in Arizona. 
And boy, was he lax that day. He came out wearing a black bathrobe. The guys were wearing brown and gold pajama pants. Uh, guys were screwing around, laughing. Well, they got to play golf. Yeah. Whoever wanted to go play golf. Yeah. And I sent that picture to you yeah. about uh, Devon Harris. I said, Devon, don't ever change, man. <laughs> he won't. He won't. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole team wears those in honor of him. Yeah. Uh, but it was really cool to see him so laid back and so lax. And that's the first time I asked him about who's going to be the OC. And he's like, Cody, damn it. Like, can we just have fun today? And I'm like, well, I think people want to know who's go- who's calling plays today, Craig. Never did find out. <laughs> he didn't really pry either. They won the game, put a bow on 2023. Jay Savell era is underway. I'm really excited about it. I think Jay is going to be, you know, I think he's going to be fine, man. I think he's going to be a good coach. I think that element that you mentioned about being a being a player's coach, um, I think that's what's going to put this program over the top. Will it happen this next year? I don't know. They have a really tough schedule. That's what I do know. It's not going to be easy to go to Tempe and win. It's not going to even be easy to go to North Texas and win. BYU is really tough, and now you have you throw in not only are you playing Air Force and Boise State at home, now you got to go on the road and play Washington State. It's a tough road to hoe, and uh, we talked about it too when we mentioned the how do you vote for predicted order of finish right now if you had a gun to your head. It'd be really hard not to say Colorado State in so many ways because they have the best returning quarterback, and for some stupid-ass reason, Torrey Horton's coming back. And yes, folks, go ahead and tweet at Cody for saying that. <laughs> he loves Colorado State. He loves At 7220 Sports. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, I mean, that's where you got to start, right, at the quarterback spot. Uh, Braden Shager is the only other quarterback coming back next year at Hawaii. Yeah, and I, I say Boise just because until somebody truly dethrones them, you have to. Is there, and we just heard that there's a backup quarterback at USC yeah. that entered the portal former and he's taking a visit. Yeah. Former number one overall recruit in the United States of America is taking a visit to Boise State. That sucks. Um, yeah, that'll be tough, but you got to start at that quarterback spot. And really, CSU has the probably, I, I don't even think there's probably about it. They have the best returning quarterback in the Mountain West. Um, so it's it's always going to be weird, but I'm with you. I've for five years now. I've had that vote in the preseason, and I've voted Boise State number one every year. I I don't see how you can't. I just can't go with CSU until Norvell proves yeah. that he yeah. can get it done there. No because doubt, he's had the most talent. Yeah, the last two years, and they have lost some dudes in the portal. And Dallin Hooker is uh, going to the NFL, uh, so they're going to lose their tight end. But they've shown, like you said, they've shown they can replace the tight end. They've shown they can replace these wide receivers. But they haven't shown much else. And Horton can't stay healthy for an entire season, too. Boy, when you're getting targeted 20 times a game, and I don't blame them for targeting him that much. Do you think that maybe they take the punt return off his plate so he's not getting those extra hits? He's so electric back there. I know. Yeah, that's tough. I totally get what you're saying. I, I think that's probably Horton's call. And you know that guy's not leaving the field. He yeah. wants to do it. Um Sometimes you got to save these guys from themselves, and I think Peasley's a perfect example of that. You, sometimes you just got to go, dude, you're done. And he would have played against Texas. And who's going to be CSU's uh, backup? Because Milton's in it. Yeah, Milton's gone. Milton's or, gone. Um, is it Milton or Millen? Millen. Millen. Okay. Clay Millen. His dad played. His dad was a backup for the Broncos. Hugh Millen. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you got to start at that quarterback spot. And to me, you know, it's not, it's certainly not going to be Hawaii. I think Braden Shaker's a good quarterback, but it's certainly not going to be them. I think San Diego State finally got a dude out of the portal. Uh, but who knows? I, I think San Diego State had a hell of a hire. Uh, that Lewis guy, Sean Lewis, yep. is going to turn around that offense. Um, so I think they're going to be good. How, how good they're going to be this year, I don't know. I will say I'm glad they're coming to Laramie. Um, you know, that's a tough place to play. So. I don't know. It's uh, to me. It's you're right. It's got to be Boise State, unfortunately, right now. But we're going to see how the rest of the chips fall before July, of course. But right now, you know, they do have Ashton Genty coming back. That Maddox Madsen kid did get some playing time this year, which is probably essentially what drove Taylor Green right out the door. Um, so I, I don't know. I guess it's Boise State, but I'm thinking n- people are going to sleep on Wyoming again. Guaranteed they are. Um, but to me, the only thing that's really going to hamper Wyoming is that schedule is tough. It's really tough. But you look back at the schedule in 2023. That's true. It was tough. That's true. I you get, could probably argue that it was one of the toughest in the Mountain West. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt about it. It was tough. No question. Um, you're happy to have that game, that Texas Tech game at home, because if it's on the road – 
That probably doesn't happen yep. if it's on the road. Um, it honestly probably steamrolls once they go up seventeen to nothing. It probably and gets worse. And even App State on the road probably yeah. lose that game. That's true. That's true. So the Cowboys just they have to serve court at home, which would mean a win over Air Force, a win over Boise State, and a win over BYU. <laughs> That's big. I'll take that. I'll take. I'll take. And that. a road win over CSU. Yeah, a road win over CSU. They play at New Mexico, uh, at San Jose State. San Jose State's another team losing their quarterback. Shaven Cordero finally is gone after ten years and. In college football in the Mountain West Conference. So it's going to be fun, man. It's going to be interesting. Uh, the off seasons are getting more and more fun. This is college football is turning way more into a 24 7 sport, and I am here for it because mm. I'm sad as shit that college football is coming to an end. And sports writers and, uh, you know, radio personalities and stuff like that, they always say, what are we going to do? There's no content. With the portal, there's content every day. Yes, there and is. And it's, it's not coming to an end. You know what I do every morning? I wake up, I reach over, eyes are half open, I grab my phone, and I go to the portal. And I look and go, all right, maybe I can go to bed for another 10 minutes. And then I start scrolling Twitter to see if any hell's broken loose there. you got to change your sleeping habits, though, because <laughs> you need to be up in the morning when it's happening. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I always say sports happen at night, so I'm up till 3 in the morning. But uh, So there's two college football games left. You know, the oh, national yeah, championships yeah. For, for both, you know, of course, Michigan against Washington on Monday night. But why in the hell is the FCS championship South Dakota State against Montana on Sunday? Has it always been on Sunday? I'm almost positive it's been on Saturday before. Huh. Why are they competing with the NFL, NFL. in the early window? And an NFL weekend that's crucially important. I... And there's nothing else going on on Saturday other than college basketball. So I. That's weird. That's a good point. I don't. I thought it was a typo on the screen. Yeah. I had to go. I rewound it and watched it. I said, no way. Then I went to my phone and looked at it. And sure as hell. Wow. Sunday at noon. Well, and I think I'll actually watch that game. I usually Oh, don't. it'll be fun. Yeah, I usually don't watch those games. I think I have like a bias against those because of the fans around here that are like, wouldn't it be neat if Wyoming was in a conference with Montana, Montana State, and nope. South Dakota State? And I'm like, absolutely not. It would be awful. That would be the death nail, no way, awful, stupid idea. Do not do it. Um, all the population in Wyoming is nowhere near Montana, for one. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> So, um, yeah, that's, South Dakota State's turned into a little juggernaut. I did watch their game last year, their championship game. They are a salty, salty bunch. I watched them beat the shit out of CSU. What was, was that last year or two years ago? Two years Fort ago. Collins, they absolutely they hammered the Rams. They just looked like a better team from top to bottom, tougher, faster, the whole nine. It was That was fun. I mean, South Dakota <laughs> State's a 13-and-a-half-point favorite. Yeah, they're good. They're Montana's really good. good, but I I think South Dakota State covers yeah, that game. Yeah, they're going to be good. I And, and then to me, it, it, it appears Michigan's kind of destined at this point, doesn't it? It does, but, man, Penix. He, I voted for Penix for Heisman. He, The way he throws the ball. Yeah. I saw it at Indiana when I covered Michigan State. Yeah, Michigan's a four and a half point favorite, and I agree. I think I think they're they grind it out. They're so physical up front. I think that they probably do hold on and win that game. But I I see another great game like the two semifinals were. Yeah, yeah, true. I don't know, and, it, and it's funny, uh, you know, I, I put in a story on 7220 Sports this week about J.S. Bell expecting to hire his new OC. What will he be tasked with? And uh, Jay was like, you know what? Look at the teams that are in the Final Four right now. He's like, they all can run the ball. Washington throws it more, but the other guys, they run the ball. I'm going to critique you by not asking a follow-up question, though, when he said 315 yards. Where'd that come from? Yeah. Just not 300, not 350, but 315. I like it. I'll take it. <laughs> I love that he's thinking that way, though, and I think it also kind of shows how he f- probably feels about how things have gone. We have to be able to throw it. Like, I wonder, I guarantee – Honestly, I'm putting words in his mouth, but I guarantee Jay has sat there and been like, dude, I would dominate this offense. And it's not – he's not saying that you have to average 315. No, every, no. It's, it's You have to be able to do it yeah. when it's called upon. Yeah. The di- most damning stat I came up with in here, eight times in the Craig Bowl era did the cow- a cow- Cowboy quarterback eclipse 300 yards. That's two years of Josh Allen. Colby Kierkegaard did it three times out of those eight times. Sean Chambers, never. 
Tyler Vanderwall, never. Levi Williams, once. And that was when they went down 14 to nothing at Colorado State in front of that empty stadium during COVID. And they played catch up the rest of the way. And Peasley didn't do it until that Hawaii game, and it took an 89-yard touchdown pass to Gillenborg, a 44-yard touchdown pass to Marquez, and a 40-yard touchdown pass to Whelan. And, folks, my silence is just me shaking my head. It's hard <laughs> to think about. And I got a couple of tweets about after you wrote that article, <laughs> yeah. and they were comparing it to other quarterbacks that did more than that this season. This, oh, yeah. Penix. Uh, Penix being Arizona. One. Yeah, Arizona. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm sure Caleb Williams. Yeah. You know, just – it's like, what? And you don't need to do it, but it's shocking. Now it's shocking, isn't it, on Sundays when you're like, oh, Allen didn't throw for 300 yards this week? He did it twice at Wyoming. One of them was in that marathon triple overtime game against UNLV. The other time was against Gardner-Webb, which I don't remember that Gardner-Webb game all that well, but I'd imagine it was a lot of Gentry catching the ball about five yards from the line of scrimmage and dusting everybody down the field. Wasn't that the game that Gentry went like 80? Don't know. He that might have been the longest. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, and that, I think they needed it to win the game. I think they kicked their ass. I know yeah, what you're yeah. talking about, right. but and I might be. Now we got to look. All right, twenty seven. We're efforting twenty seven nothing. Oh. Wyoming wins that game. Well, there was another game where we needed, or we Wyoming needed, a, and that might have been the Dave Christensen era against an FCS team. It was like, what are they doing out there? <laughs> and then they needed it. They Somebody caught a pass and to win the game in the last couple minutes, but went like eighty some yards. Yeah. Okay. So this is twenty seventeen. So Gentry wasn't on this team. Allen twenty two of thirty two, three hundred twenty eight yards and two touchdowns. Austin Conway eleven receptions, one hundred thirty five yards and a score. Uh, long of thirty four. C J Johnson six catches, one hundred thirty yards and a score. Forty seven was his long. Josh Harshman had a thirty one yarder as well. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it took. That's what it took to get him over 300 yards. And then that – that tw- I'm looking this up too while we're here. Screw it. Sorry, folks. My memory's not as good as it once was. And <laughs> some of that was damaged in Tucson. Yeah. yeah. I didn't do enough damage on my brain <laughs> in Tucson, unfortunately. So we all remember the 69-66 triple overtime loss at UNLV, which is still one of the most inexcusable uh, performances I've ever seen in my life. Josh Allen four, only completed 14 passes in that game. 14 of 31, 334 yards, four touchdowns, two picks. Tanner Gentry, five catches for 184 yards and three touchdowns. Jacob Hollister, four for 91 and a touchdown. Jake Mulhart, four for 45, and C.J. Johnson, one for 14. Brian Hill also ran for 119 yards. I believe they had a kick return for a touchdown in that game. Yeah, uh... Punt return, Austin Conway, 60-yard touchdown return. I believe they also had a pick six in that game. Uh, They scored in every way possible and still found a way to lose. UNLV's quarterback, Kurt Plandish, whoever the hell that is, uh, 20 of 32, 252 yards and three touchdowns. Gross. Sorry for that walk down memory lane. Gross. Anyway. I say Wyoming wins that game with the new uh, (laughs) two-point conversion rules after this. First, you have to go for two. Yeah, Brian Back Hill gets in. Back then, I think in. it was after three. You had yeah, to go for two. I think Brian Hill gets in on that one. Uh, if you missed any of our Arizona Bowl coverage, uh, there's a ton of it. Um, wrote a lot down in down in Tucson. Um, really good stuff. I really like the turning point story, the, that column this week. Uh, turned out really well. It was really good for John Hoyland. Um, also, on the basketball side of things, the Quail Cott sinks a buzzer beater the other night to beat the San Jose State Spartans at home. Hate to ever say anything's a must win. That was a must win. Cowboys are now going to Albuquerque and Logan. Utah State has won twelve straight. Pokes did win on the road at New Mexico last year. They yeah. Yeah, they did. Um But what a <laughs> league, huh? Wow. Good. Basketball. I mean, hate to say it, but Colorado State's damn good. They are. Uh, Utah State's damn good. Of course, San Diego State goes into Gonzaga and knocks them off. Only Gonzaga's second loss in the last like hundred and sixty games at home. It's incredible. <clears throat> and then uh, – So that's why San Jose State's a must win. You have to win those games. You have games. to win those kind of games, especially when they're they're beat up. Yeah. They got some guys out. Uh, so the Mountain West Conference is the only league in America that had every team above 500 going into conference play. <laughs> yeah. And, it, yeah, some of it's scheduling. But, I mean, it's pretty dang good. Well, and honestly, Boise State's played the toughest schedule of them all, and I think they're going to be – 
just as good, I think. They're you know, always there in the end. Yeah. Imagine that CSU-Boise State game this year. Boise State-San Diego State. Uh, the Mountain West Tournament in Vegas is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I wish I could tell you the Wyoming Cowboys will be involved <laughs> to the end, but uh, it's tough. I think they're just going to keep getting better and better, though. Yeah. Uh, Mason Walters, you know, he's only a few games into his D1 career. Yeah. He's just going to keep getting better. And um, I I'm, can't even pronounce Go Janets. There you go. Yeah. What a great game he had the other night. They kept feeding him. He kept going to the free throw line. Yeah. You know, and he he does have to get stronger, though. Yeah. His hands. He drops a lot of passes and stuff like that and rebounds. But he played really well the other night. And without him, they wouldn't have won that game. Yeah. Well, we saw Caden Powell kind of deal with that same issue last year as a freshman. And essentially, Oleg Kajenitz is a freshman. Yep. I mean, he's been in the league for – or he's been in, the, in college basketball for a couple of years. But – He's essentially a freshman, um, you know, Cotton Griffin just keeps scoring, but they have to lock it down on D. They gave up nine nine triples in the first half and let them shoot 50%. That just can't happen. They were saying that, you know, after the game at BYU where they just got totally slaughtered, <sighs> uh, Sam Griffin actually played really good defense that game. Of course, it was going on during the football game. He hardly anybody watched it. Yeah, I missed but, that one, darn it. But at the same time, you know, he, he played really good D. Yeah. He needs to put it together on both ends of the court. Yeah. They all do. I think that's always been the knock on Griffin and Cott, who's they can score with the best of them. But, and I think a lot of people are really kind of turning their guns on Brendan Wenzel right now, but he does draw the toughest defensive assignment every single night. It's really hard to put it out on both sides of the floor. It just is. And he's so unselfish that he – he doesn't really care if he scores or not. Yeah. He wants to lock people down on defense and grab those rebounds. Yep. No and, doubt. You know, you turn the page to Cowgirl basketball. They're off to a 2-0 and start. Nice win in Logan a, last night. And they, had, they played a really tough non-conference schedule. Yeah. It's going to build them up for the conference season. Yeah, and I honestly, I think the Cowboys played a pretty decent non-conference schedule as well. I think that's going to help. Yeah. Um, you know, it's one of those things. I wrote a column before the season. Just play your ass off. The fans will... The fans will get behind you if you play your ass off and do the right things and just upset some teams. Take care of your home floor as much as humanly possible. Win, win a game or two you shouldn't. Take care of business at home as much as possible. You remember the student sports commentator from, I think it was Dayton, like 25 years ago, said something like, boom goes the dynamite. Yeah. So I watched the highlights of the Cowgirl game at Utah State yesterday. Two students are doing the game, which they're, they have need a lot of practice. By <laughs> they showed, like, the first shot that Utah State made. This kid s- said something like, Kool-Aid. And if I had more time and I actually cared, I would have rewound it. And, like, what is he really saying? And what? But, yeah, after a, a three-pointer, he says something like, Kool-Aid. Isn't that Utah of the? And that just reminded me. I went right to that Dayton. <laughs> boom goes the dynamite. He's going to be ridiculed for life. <laughs> Are they allowed to have Kool Aid in Utah? Is there such thing at Utah State? <laughs> the Rebels, the Renegades. Uh, as we end here, I want to play something that's kind of self-serving in a way, um, but something that meant a lot to me, and I really want to uh, play this for you. So just uh, go ahead and give this a listen. We'll talk after. Craig Bowl did not need to say that. Um, I thought it was really cool of him to say it, and it meant a lot to me because um, we're in a new age of journalism, to say the least. Um, you have guys that are covering these teams, uh, big-time quotes here, covering these teams that really aren't covering these teams. They're just fans. Um they even wear the gear. Um, you know, they're not even hiding it anymore, and – it was a big worry for me, Jared, as you know, when I started this uh, venture because I'm I am a Wyoming fan. I've been a Wyoming fan my whole life, like a big, big, big Wyoming fan. Um, but it, because of that, I've m- taken extra responsibility to make damn sure that it's fair, balanced, is what it is. No brown and gold colored glasses. And I'm unfortunately, I got some a piece of advice at Michigan State from a, one of my colleagues, and he said. You don't want to cover a team you grew up rooting for because you're going to see how the sausage is made and you're not going to like it. And then all of a sudden, you're also not going to have, you're not going to be a diehard of that team anymore. And I thought, no way. That ain't going to happen to me. I cover this team so fair and balanced. It's, it kind of bums me out because I have lost that. On Saturdays, I don't have a team to go for anymore. Of course, I hope the Cowboys win, uh, but I don't have that rooting, that getting out, having fun, tailgating. All that kind of stuff. So 
I really appreciate Craig Bull saying, you know, not only thank you to the media, I mean, who the hell does that, but we do have a nice relationship and we had a good relationship with Craig and I wish him nothing but the best. Um, really appreciated my time with him. He's the only Cowboy head football coach I've ever known. I, this is my fifth year doing this and he's the only one I've ever known. And of course we've had our ups and downs, but I don't think respect or anything was ever lost on either side. Um, when he would go ape shit on me, he apologized. Um, when he would call me out on something, I would say, let's talk about it. And sometimes I'd say, all right, I see where you're coming from now. That was a really nice working relationship. And I already have a relationship with Jay Savell, so I'm really, really excited to uh, to see how that goes and see where that goes, uh, where it grows. I still want to hear about your trip to Craig's house for Manhattan. <laughs> oh. I hope that happens before he officially moves yeah out of town yeah i would love that i would love to talk to him off the record just have a total night of just off the record i don't you know what i don't even care if we talk about football i just want to have an off the record night just shooting the ball with him and of course getting drunk i'm always into that and uh i mean probably learn a hell of a lot more of the game yeah than you ever thought you would you might think you know things sure yeah like, like really that's how okay yeah no, and that's what I that's the relationship I had with Tim Polisek. I'd be like, tell me I want to be the best reporter I can be and get the accurate everything yeah. accurate out there. So if you if you catch me slipping or think I'm not being accurate or being fair, please just reach out, man. I'm not gonna be offended or pissed off. And that's what I always appreciated about Bart Miller in twenty nineteen when the Cowboys ran it into a brick wall on fourth down at Boise State and eventually Cooper Roth missed the field goal to win that game, I questioned Craig on that Monday. Like, what were you thinking? Like, that that wouldn't that play doesn't work. Bart Miller called me into his office and put it on the big screen and showed me, this is why it was supposed to work. And he's like, this had to happen, this had to happen, this had to happen, so did this, and so did this. And I looked at Bart and said, give me a break. I was like, so I was right. And he goes, well, theoretically, it could have worked. And I'm like, that is stupid. Well, everybody's ridiculing Alabama on the last play of the game the yeah. other night. Yeah. The low snap threw the whole thing off. No doubt. And they showed the swing. It was supposed to be a swing pass. It was perfectly blocked to the outside. The guy most likely would have walked in. Yeah. But he had to hurry so much that yeah. the timing was off. And that's what had, yep. he said. You know, they had nine guys in the box for Boise State. A guy blew Logan Harris back. With Logan Harris losing one step back, that threw the whole play out of whack. And I'm like, man, aren't there some higher percentage calls out there than this? Especially with nine guys in the box? What the hell are you guys doing? And I didn't frame the question very nice to Craig, but it was kind of on purpose. I was like, does your offensive coordinator have the same vantage point of the game as I do up in the press box? And he said, yeah. And I'm like, so he knew there was that many dudes that close to the line of scrimmage. Yeah. And I'm like, do you hear the play call through your headset? (laughs) Kill, Uh, kill, kill. (laughs) Yeah. And he's like, yes. And I said, can you veto the play call? And he's like... Last I checked, my front door says head blank and coach on it. And I go, why didn't you change the play call? So it was not a good way to go. And that was my first year covering the team. So that didn't exactly go over. It went over like a lead balloon. But I always appreciated Bart Miller for saying, hey, come here. Let me show you why this should have worked. And it, man, it would have taken an act of God for that to work. And so he didn't say, you know, he, he wasn't coming at me like, look at this. This is how it was supposed to happen. He goes, this is what was supposed to happen. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot of stuff that needs to happen to make that play. And you just blew an opportunity to win at Boise State. Damn it. (laughs) So, anyway, long story short, I'm really thankful for Craig Bull and and the time we had together, and I'm really looking forward to working with Jay. And I think for Wyoming fans, you don't know what you got till it's gone. And, yes, we were all very – we got after Craig quite a bit, and I'm I'm guilty of it as well. Yeah. I mean, I thought he was just too strict at times, but um, hopefully Jay just takes this and goes with it, yeah. and we, like Wyoming doesn't miss a beat. I think they will. I think his personality is going to be the thing that puts him over the top in the end. I really do. And you're seeing that with the transport. All guys want to play for him. Yep. So, One good thing for you as a baseball fan, me as a baseball fan, 42 days till pitchers 42 and catchers. 42 days. Boy, did I – I thought about that a lot in Arizona, driving by those spring training. I stayed right by where the Diamondbacks train there at Camelback or whatever it's called, and I was just like, man, how did the Phillies lose to the damn Diamondbacks? How does that happen? But excited for it. It's going to be fun. Another year. Um, hopefully some other teams not named the Dodgers start making some moves. That would be cool. The Dodgers and Yankees, <laughs> they might make the playoffs. <laughs> Yeah. Those payrolls are just ridiculous. Wow, Dodgers are all in. <laughs> they are all in, especially on a guy who's having Tommy John surgery who 
is not even going to be able. Maybe we'll never pitch again. Who knows? Who is making more money in one year than like four MLB rosters? Yeah. I think his contract, I saw something silly, like he could buy an NHL franchise or something like that. But he, it's all backloaded. Yeah. You know. The bill's going to come due one day. Yep. One day. And he probably won't even be playing when it does. We'll see another Daryl Strawberry or uh, Bobby Bonilla effect where he gets paid for 50 years, $2 million a year for 50 Bobby Bonilla years. day, every July. Every July. Right on, Jared. Well, thank you so much for everything. It's been a fun year. Um, we'll definitely have some football stuff to talk about in the coming weeks, but uh, we have to shift our focus to basketball. Basketball and some other stuff. and yeah. we'll, we'll get some guests on, so it's not just – you're hearing my voice and Cody's voice. We're yeah. going to get some folks on here and have some fun with them and yeah. talk about things, sports, not sports, yeah. food, start, music. Start opening it up a little Whatever. bit here. Yeah. I just am always afraid I'm going to get myself in trouble, which is exactly why i got to go cut some audio out at the 1451 mark of this episode. <laughs> and again, you're going to have to cut it out here at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to repeat what I said. <laughs> All right. So long.